have your Bibles, go to Nehemiah 13. Nehemiah 13. We'll finally finish the book of Nehemiah. Um, if you miss any of it, I'm sure they'll, they'll be updated on the app and um, also on the website. I, I get nervous when it's, when it's a little light for the earliest service. I, I just hope we can fit everybody for the 1130 service. Um, so just pray that God's will is done today. All right, Nehemiah 13. Finally going to finish this book. Remember, Nehemiah had just got through with Ezra the scribe dedicating the, the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Remember, he had gone back from being the king's cupbearer in Persia, King Artaxerxes. He had gone back to Jerusalem because he was brokenhearted for God and for God's people and for God's city. So he goes back, and when he gets back there, the temple has been erected, but it's been decades upon decades, and the walls of Jerusalem still are not up. They're in rubble. The gates are burned with fire. Nehemiah walks around the city. He can't even get a donkey, which is made to do these kind of things, climb up over the walls. That's how much of a disaster it was. So Nehemiah, along with 40,000, 30,000 to 40,000 people that have come back, to Jerusalem, many have come back before, decades before, Nehemiah goes back to really head up the rebuilding of these walls for the protection of the city, for the blessing of the city, so they can really start to worship the Lord. And so the city is really protected from the outside influences. Now, Nehemiah does this. And as he does this, he gets a passionate, on fire heart, his heart is on fire for God. And as he surveys the city, he's broken hearted. And that after surveying the city and after offering up days of prayer to God, he gathers together some of the leadership. And then they start to rebuild the walls. Now, when you start to do something for God, as we've learned as we've gone through this book, it's never easy. It always gets more difficult, right? So sometimes we think, Lord, I must be out of your will because things are getting harder. Well, sometimes you're right in the center of God's will because things are getting harder. Remember, Jesus sent the disciples out into the Sea of Galilee in the midst of the storm. They were right in the center of God's will. Now, the walls go up. While they're going up, there's opposition from without. Remember, Sanballat, the Horonite from the north, he makes war with the children of Israel. Some of the people actually hide, his people actually hide in the rubble and try to war against the children of Israel. And then from within, there was this guy, Tobiah, that had marital ties, something to the priesthood. We'll get into that in chapter 13. And he was on the inside trying to undo what Nehemiah was trying to do for God. But in 52 days, with the children of Israel working hard, the walls go up. Remember, those who lived in the city, right, were chosen to live in the city. They rebuilt the walls that were closest to their house. Obviously, if you live near this part of the wall and the wall's broken down, you want to put that part of the wall up first so your household and your family will be protected. So 52 days, the walls go up. After the walls go up, remember, there's a national call to repentance. Ezra the scribe stands up, and he gets on scaffolding, and he starts to read the book of the law for six hours. The first three he'd read, the next three the Levites would go out, and they would read it to the people as individuals, and the people were confessing sin, repenting of sin, turning from sin. You remember the story if you've gone through this at all. And, and, and they agree with Nehemiah, they agree with Ezra the scribe that, you know what, they've sinned and their fathers have sinned before them, and, and there's a national cry and call to repentance. And they agree with Nehemiah, with the leadership, with God at that time, that they are no longer going to compromise. They are no longer going to worship pagan gods. They are no longer going to neglect the temple and the city in in and giving to the temple and to the city, and taking care of God's servants in the temple and the city, the Levites and the priests, right? And they covenant with God to do this. Now, after that happens, remember they sign a document. All of these people, that's what all the numbering and the the names were in the previous couple chapters. These are the people who signed. These are the people who signed. These are the people who signed. Well, chapter 13, we're about 10 to 12 years from that, Okay? 10 to 12 years from all these people in this national revival, some 30 to 40,000 signing this covenant, this document saying, we're not going to worship false gods. We're not going to neglect God's temple or God's city. We're not going to neglect God's priest and the Levites. We're not going to do it. We're going to honor the Sabbath, they, they, they tell them. 
Well, we're 10 to 12 years from that. And remember, when Nehemiah first went out years before to start this process, remember King Artaxerxes said to him, you can go from Persia back to Israel, to Jerusalem, and I'll let you do this, and I'll give you building materials, I'll give you um, a, a king's entourage to make sure you're protected, I'll give you signed letters from the king to let you do this stuff, but I want you to come back, Nehemiah, because you're a good servant, and I need you around my kingdom, so I'm going to give you as long as you need, years to do this, but when it's completed, come back. Nehemiah does go back, okay? This is how we know we're about 10 to 12 years from there. Nehemiah goes back, and as always, as you read through the scriptures, when there's, the, there's a lack in godly leadership, the people backslide, okay? So Nehemiah goes back again, and this is what he finds 10 to 12 years later, after the people had promised not to worship false gods, not to give their sons and daughters to the pagan sons and daughters of the, of the Ammonites and the Moabites, not to neglect, they promise not to neglect God's temple and God's worship. Well, 10 to 12 years later, this is what we read, chapter 13. On that day, they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever, because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass, when they had heard the law, that they separated from Israel the, all the mixed multitude. So we see, we're still on the right path here, but watch what happens. Now, and before this, Eliashib the priest having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. Now remember, who was this guy Tobiah? He was the guy at the beginning in, in chapter 2, 3, and 4 there who's hooked up with Sanballat because he has ties on the inside to undo what Nehemiah is trying to do for the people of God. So now we have a priest of God, Eliashib, who's married in to the family, or, or, or Tobiah is married into this family, and his kid is married into that family. Okay? Now, it's interesting. What happens here is there was a chamber that they kept in the temple of God that was supposed to be filled with some things. Well, this guy, Tobiah, kind of gets rid of that stuff that's supposed to be in the chamber of the temple of God, and he puts his own stuff in there. Let's read. And before this, verse 4, Eliashib, the, high, the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of God. How did he become the... <laughs> The overseer of the chamber of the house of God. How? How did that happen? Obviously, they're sliding. Before this, he had, what was he doing? He was going to the nobles. He was going to the people while Nehemiah was getting all this going for God, raising up the walls and everything else. And he was little by little sowing discord amongst God's people, the Jews. And little by little, he creeps in, Right? Back by Nehemiah, now the walls are done, Nehemiah is away, and he kind of slides in, and he takes over. That's what wolves do in churches, okay? Little by little, they'll backbite the leadership. Little by little, they'll go behind the scenes, and they'll say, hey, do you know this? Hey, do you know that? Hey, did you hear this? Do you know that? Did you hear this? And that, if you're godly, you should say to that person, hey, have you talked to that person about that? Oh, and I, I just know, this is just, just between me and you. When you hear the between me and you, that's a problem. That's basically, you need to listen to what I'm saying because I don't want to talk to that other person about it, right? That's what Tobiah did. Now, Nehemiah goes back to fulfill his office as the cupbearer under Artaxerxes, and he sneaks and he makes his way in. Now, the chamber, the, the, this chamber in the house of God, verse 5, what was it for? He had prepared for him a great chamber where aforetime before this... They laid the meat offerings, frankincense, and the vessels, and the tides of corn, new wine, and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the offerings of the priest. So this chamber, this storehouse, if you will, this is where they kept some of the tithes, the grain offerings. This is where they kept the new wine to, to be a blessing to some of the Levites and the priests. This is where they kept all those things, frankincense, which, which is a, you know, 
a costly spice. That was supposed to be there to be a blessing to God, the house of God, and to the workers of God. Tobiah makes his way in. He pushes that stuff out, and he fills it with his own stuff. He kind of takes over in the temple of God. Interesting, this chamber. Now listen, very practical application here. The Bible tells us that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? And listen, we all have chambers in the recesses of our hearts, okay? That if we don't fill it, fill it, keep it filled with the Holy Spirit, with godly things, we're going to start to fill those chambers with Tobias. We're going to start to fill those chambers in the recesses of our lives and in our hearts with other things. And, the, and, and you know what? Our lives are going to get cluttered. And before you know it, we're too busy for God. And the backslide starts. The backslide always starts spiritually. It always starts on the inside in the chambers of our our heart. This is what chapter 13 is about, unfortunately. Nehemiah comes in, comes back, and he like cleans house, gets him back on the path. But I think the Holy Spirit needs to do that in some of our hearts and lives many times. Because we have the chambers of our heart, instead of filling it with God and with godly things, and, and, and the things that Philippians 4 talks about, you know, peaceable things, loving things, virtuous things, things of good report, instead of filling it with those things, we fill it with everything else, and it becomes cluttered and a mess. And the backslide starts. This is what happened corporately to Israel when this false leader gets in there. Now, Verse 6, but in all this time was not I at Jerusalem. So he was away from Jerusalem, remember? For in two and in the thirteenth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, came I unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave. I only had certain days to, to, to go from the king. I had made a commitment to the king to go and do this for my people, and I had to go back. And I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. He goes to Eliashib and he goes, what is this you're doing? You're supposed to be a priest. How can you compromise? You're supposed to be a leader of God's people. How can you compromise? How can you do this? How can you push out the new wine and the grain offerings and the tithes and all these things that are set apart for the worship of God and the blessings of God's servants? And how do you let this guy Tobiah in here? What fellowship has light with darkness? You can't do this. Now listen, this is good counseling. As we go through Nehemiah, He just said, this is evil. He didn't say, let's just sit down. Let's have a conference together. Let's just reason together. We'll have a conference and we'll talk about these things. We'll kind of figure it out together. He goes, this is evil. You cannot let an unbeliever in to the house of God and take residence there. You can't do that. He goes, how can you do that? It's evil. Listen, it's very simple. The more you... Hang with unbelievers, the more you act like unbelievers. Listen, hear me on this one. You say, well, Pastor Matt, we're supposed to be salt and light and witnesses. Yes, you are. Your sole motive and your sole goal should be to win them to Jesus Christ. If you become a person that likes to hang out with people that don't love Jesus more than you hang out with Jesus people, be careful. I got like this for a while way back in the day. It's like, oh, you know, Jesus people, all they do is judge me anyway. And, oh, I don't like it, and, you know, this and that, and they talk about me, and then, you know, they're just as sinful as I am. They're worse than me, and blah, 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 blah. So I just wanted to hang out with my buddies again. And that's how the slide begins. Very simple. If you send a German shepherd with a pack of wolves, okay, will the pack of wolves, become, will, will, will they become like the German shepherd, a, a domesticated dog? Or is the German shepherd going to become a wild dog? I think so. I think that's what's going to happen. He goes, how can you let this happen? How can you throw out God's resources and fill the temple of God with Tobiah's pagan resources? Nehemiah comes back. "This, This is good counsel. This is evil. You can't do this. The backslide begins spiritually. Now watch. 
He loved this guy. And it grieved me sore, verse 8. Therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. See what he did? He said, you can't do this, Elisha. You're supposed to be a priest of God. He goes, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it. And he goes in and he takes Tobiah's crap and he throws it out on the street. All right? That's what he does. Very simple. Some of us need to do that in our homes. Really. Some of us need to do that in our homes. God knows what's going on with your DVD players and everything else. God knows what's going on with your computers. God knows all of that stuff. He sees it. You can't fool him. Right? You can't. See, this is a radical change. This is what I think God looks for. Right? Nehemiah says this is evil, and because it's evil, it's out of the temple of God. And he goes in, and he says, this is Tobiah's stuff. When it's supposed to be filled with stuff to worship God, get rid of it. And he throws it out, gone on the street. Now, can you imagine Tobiah, he come, when he comes back, he goes, he, he, he's probably thinking, what is going on here? Why is all my stuff outside? Too bad. It, it reminds me of the, of the story of Jesus. When he goes in to the temple. And the money changes are out there taking advantage of the people. What did Jesus do? The Son of God. He doesn't say, hey, let's, let's talk about this. Let me preach a nice message to you. Though he did that many times, he comes in and he says, this is enough. This is sick. You're making merchandise of the people of God. You're turning my father's house into a house of merchandise and a den of thieves. And he flips the tables over and he drives them out. Get out. I just think in the churches of America how... How much that really has to happen. Really. <laughs> Did you know, listen to this. If you, if you don't know this about me, I, I, I used to be a saltwater fish nut. I had the, this giant fish tank and everything else. and Fish from the Red Sea. $350 fish from the Red Sea. I can name like all the fish if you know them, right? I, I lived in a basement apartment, okay? But I had a, a fish tank that was worth more than a house. Does that make any sense to you? So, sometimes I, I look, and you ever watch that show Tanked? I like that show. Me and my kids watch that. They build these elaborate saltwater tanks in places, and it, it's cool. Did you know there's a church in Texas, okay? Now talk about extreme. The whole front of the church has like a two million, ga- four million gallon, I think it is, saltwater fish tank. It's worth like $40 million dollars. Someone needs to go in there and take a sledgehammer to that thing. Really. Now, again, I'm not against having a fish tank in church to show the kids or whatever during you know, Sunday school. That's cool. But is that extremism or what? And, of course, it's a church that teaches people, you know what? God wants to make you rich. So if you buy one of the fish in this tank go, you know, and put it in there, God will make you rich. You might have one of these in your house. Crazy. They have three marine biologists on staff. At a church. I think if Nehemiah were around, he would have walked in and smashed that tank and said, this stuff's got to go. This stuff's got to go. It's got to go. But I, and I think about this stuff. And it, it, it's so sad. People want to fill up God's place, God houses with everything else that is not godly. Nehemiah comes back. Tobiah, your stuff's out on the street. Now Watch. Then I commanded, now listen, and they cleansed, verse 9, the chambers, and thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. You see what he says? He goes, you know what? That stuff's out. Clean this place up of this stink. Clean it up. Clean this place up. And bring, in, bring back in the holy vessels that we use to worship God. How about bringing the word of God back into the churches? Because that's what needs to happen. Let's exalt the word of God. Let's bring the word of God back into the churches. He says, bring the holy artifacts back in and get this stuff out. See, and, and when we do that spiritually between us and God, and you know what? When we clean up our lives and, and, and God knows what's going on again behind the scenes and we say, God, enough, that stuff's out, you know what? The Holy Spirit can come and fill us again. Very simple. 
So he goes, verse 10. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them. For the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one to his field. So the Levites, who were supposed to be supported by the people so they can do ministry, they said there's not enough offerings coming in. So obviously they go and, and, and they go back into the fields and they're not there to direct the worship of God. Nehemiah is a contemporary to who? Malachi. Malachi. And the priest, instead of the priest standing up and telling the people, listen, you need to worship God. Tobiah, stay away from the temple of God. Right? This stuff is here to worship God. The people, you need to bring your, your offerings, your sacrifices to worship God. This is what you need to do. They cower. They get afraid. They get scared. And they said, you know what? We're just going to go back to work in the field. We're not going to stand up for the temple of God. Remember the problem with Malachi? Go to Malachi, last book of the Old Testament. Remember, the Old Testament's not so much in chronological order. But, but Malachi is a contemporary with Nehemiah during this time. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Very famous passage of Scripture. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, wherein have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. This is what was going on in Nehemiah's day. No one brought anything else to the temple of God. The Levites were afraid to stand up for God. They went back into the field, so an unbeliever plants himself in there. Right? Now watch what he says. You are cursed with the curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse that, you may, that, that there may be meat. There it is. Remember the meat offering. That's what he's talking about. That was gone. In mine house, improve me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up to you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there shall, be no, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God says, go ahead and try me. God blames the Levites first. And the priests were not standing up for the house of God. Nehemiah had to come back to do that, and God had to send Malachi to them. Right? Now listen. Go back to Nehemiah. Look what, look what he does, verse 11. Then contended I. <laughs> this is kind of a light word, but in the Hebrew, it means he was yelling at people. Yelling and screaming at people. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, but that's what he did. Then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is this the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. He sets the Levites and the people. He starts to set them back in the order of worship. Then brought all Judah the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil unto the treasuries and the storehouses, right? Then Judah... Because as a leader, they're telling the people to honor God and do things for God's glory. Then the people say, yes, let's do it. And then they start to bring the tithes. They start to bring the offerings. And I made, verse 13, treasures over the treasuries, Shalmiah the priest of Zadok, the scribe and of the Levites, Padiah, and next to them was Hanan the son of Zechur, the son of Mataniah, for they were counted faithful, and their office was, was to distribute unto their brethren. He says he brings back in the priests, he brings back in the scribe, he brings back in the Levites, he brings in assistance for them back into the temple, and the one qualification he looked in that for them was they were faithful. I want these faithful men to start to serve God's people again. And he brings them back in and he sets them in order. Now listen to what he says, verse 14. Remember me. You're going to see this four times in Nehemiah chapter 13. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this. And wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the offices thereof. See what he says? God, you're my God. And because you're my God, I'm jealous for your people. See, you can't love Jesus. Jesus can't be your God if you don't love Jesus' people. Right? It's very simple. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, in 1 John, you know you've passed from death unto life if you love the brethren. Peter, after the resurrection, Jesus goes to him. And he goes, Peter, do you love me? You know I love you, God. 
It was a different Greek word. It was, I, I like you. I don't love you the way you love me, Lord, but, but I do love you, but not to the same extent. He asked him again, do you love me? Well, you know all things. Do you love me? Yes, God, I, I, I love you. Not the way I'm supposed to. Well, if you love me even that much, Peter, you feed my lambs. You feed my people. You bless them, right? Verse 15. Now, there's a backslide in regards to the temple. There's a backslide also. Here it is in regards to the Sabbath. Isn't it so interesting? Same thing spiritually in our lives. This is exactly what happens when we start to backslide on the inside between our own relationship with God. What's the next thing to backslide? I don't have to go to church no more. I don't want to go to church. I don't have to bring my kids to church. I don't want to do any of that. I I I believe in God. I'll do it over there. Well, there's a backslide into the Sabbath. Verse 15, In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, bringing in sheaves and lading asses, also wine grapes and figs and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Here it is again. Then I contended, or I was yelling and screaming, with the nobles of Judah, and said unto them, What evil thing is this that you do, and you profane the Sabbath? You know what profane means? It means you just make it common. You make it like it's any other day. He goes, How do you do this? He tells the nobles, because remember the nobles, you see them through the book of Nehemiah. They kind of wanted to get involved in the work, but they didn't. They didn't want to get their hands dirty. They had the money, so they started to buy the children of Israel, sell them into slavery. Nehemiah had to correct that. Now here they are again. They're all about the money. They said, the Sabbath day is just a common day. Bring in the people of Tyre. Keep the trade going on the Sabbath day. And they, they didn't honor God's Sabbath. Right? Sad. When you start to slide on the inside, the first thing that's going to overflow through to is your corporate worship. Honoring the Sabbath, keeping it holy between you and God and your family. And what did they do? Nehemiah confronts them. He yells and screams at them. He goes, how are you making the Sabbath day just a common thing? Didn't that happen in this country? Now, again, these Christians were not Sabbath keepers, okay? Sabbath's a Saturday. So, again, if you want to keep Sabbath, you can do that, but make sure you work six days first. We don't want to do that one. I work four or five, but it's six and... Our Sabbath is in Jesus Christ, okay? We have rest in Jesus Christ. But the application here still holds true. Christians worship since all the way from the first century on the first day of the week. Sunday, because that's when Jesus rose from the dead. But did you know 50 years ago, everything was closed on Sunday? Closed, right? Everything was closed. People spent time with family. They went to church, and they spent time with family for the most part. Well... Little by little, we slide from God, we slide from God, we slide from God. We don't exalt the word of God. Now, Sunday is just a common thing. Now you have to go to work. You have to beg your boss to get Sunday off to bring your family to church with you. That's what happens. There's nothing new under the sun. Make God's day just a common thing, right? Now, God sees our hearts. Now, when we, we don't stand up here. Remember, the Sabbath, what was the penalty for the Sabbath? Penalty for breaking the Sabbath was you were supposed to get stoned. Okay? It says all the way back in the Pentateuch, what did they do? There was a guy on the Sabbath day. He was picking up sticks presumptuously, thinking Sabbath day is no big deal. And Moses says, what are you doing? And they stoned him. I think a lot more people go to church if we stoned a couple of them on Sundays. <laughs> but the point is true here. What he's saying is true. It's a heart. There's a spirit of the law, and there's the letter of the law. Does the letter of the law say, hey, you need to be in church every Sunday, every Wednesday, every this, every that. We're going to take attendance. Some churches do that. That's fine. We don't. But it's your heart. Because man looks on the outer appearance, God looks on the heart. You should want to be involved. You should want to get involved with God's people in a corporate fellowship. See, God sees those things. They slide, they profane the Sabbath day. 
Verse 18, he says, Did not your fathers thus and did not uh, the evil of, listen, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon the city? Yet you bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. He goes, Don't you remember why we went, why we were sold into exile to begin with? Decades before? Hundreds of years before. He goes, Don't you remember what your forefathers did? They forgot about God's Sabbath, they forgot about God's word, and they went and ended up in Babylon. He goes, what are you doing? You want this to happen again? Now watch. 19. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, listen to, this, listen to what this guy does. I love this guy. I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be open till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants said I at the gates that there should, there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and the sellers of all kind of law lodged Without Jerusalem, once or twice, only once or twice, and there's a reason for that. So you know what Nehemiah does? He goes, you guys don't want to listen? You guys don't want to honor the Sabbath? Nehemiah goes around, he gets a cohort, and he shuts all the gates, and he tells the traders that want to come in on the Sabbath, he goes, you can wait out there all night long. That's what he does. So you know what the traders did that wanted to trade on the Sabbath and sell on the Sabbath? They camped outside the gates. People lost money on the inside, and the, trader, and the traders on the outside, they lost money. Nehemiah said, I don't care if you're losing money, lock the gates. This is God's Sabbath. Wait a minute, but I can't get involved in ministry. I can't do anything for God. I can't serve the Lord because, you know, i, I, I got to have my 767 cable stations. Yeah, I don't want to drive just this kind of a car. I got to have this kind of a car. That's what we do too. You know what Nehemiah would do? He would take your car and he'd, he'd smash it and he'd bring it back to the dealership. And he'd say, honor God. Know what he would do? Listen, honestly, know what he would do? This is hard stuff, but I'm just reading my Bible. Do you know what he would do? With the Christians who don't want to get their families involved in some fellowship and worship because they, they just have to make so much of a certain amount of money to keep up with everyone else and not just honor God first. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's right to pay your bills. You have to pay them. That's godly. But you know if you get out of balance. You know what he would do? He would wait at the door on Sunday morning to the place that you worked and he'd shut the door right in front of you. And he'd say, go to church. <laughs> that's what he would do. That's what he did. In his day and age, that, in that context, that's what he did. That's what he did. They waited outside the city. It says once or twice, and look in verse 21. Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why do you lodge about the wall? Why are you guys waiting out here? If you do so again, I'll lay hands on you from that time forth. <laughs> Came they no more on the Sabbath. He goes, If you guys stay here again, I'm going to beat you guys back. Physically, that's what he tells them. Talk about zeal. I'm not saying go and do that. Don't beat up anybody that, you know, has fallen backsliding from God. You can pray for them. You can love them. But that's what Nehemiah did. Verse 22. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. He goes, make the Sabbath day holy again. And he says, remember me, O oh my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. Don't you love this guy? Seriously, I love this guy. He's doing this good stuff for God, for God's temple, for God's people, for God's city. And he's not sitting there saying, God, look what I'm doing for you. He says, remember me, God, just have mercy on me. He basically says, God, this is the least I can do for you, God. Verse 23. In those days also, here we go, when you backslide on the inside, then you backslide from corporate worship with other believers, you eventually backslide in relationships. In those days also I saw the Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, Ashdod's the, the, where the Philistines come from, of Ammon and of Moab. And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. 
And I counted and I contended. There it is. I was yelling at people again with them and cursed them and smote certain of them, plucked off their hair and made them swear by God saying, you shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. See what he says? Now remember, they had just made a covenant some 12 years before this that they weren't going to do these things. That they were going to honor God's Sabbath. That they were going to honor God's temple. That they were going to honor God by making sure that believers married believers. And what happened? They didn't do any of it only 12 years later. Sad. That's how fast we can slide. And listen, when we slide, there's always consequences for sin. Our little ones, you know what? They catch on to that and they slide too. Right? What does it talk about in Malachi? Malachi about marriage. Remember what was going on? Again, it's a contemporary. What they were doing was this. They were, some of the Ashdod women and the Ammonite women and the Moab women, they were a little younger. They were a little bit more beautiful. They were divorcing their wives, their Jewish wives, and they were saying, hey, let's hook up with them. That's what they did. And they hooked up with them They had kids with them, and of course the kids didn't learn the ways and the customs of the Jewish people to honor God, to honor his temple. What did they do? Nehemiah said they went back and the kids couldn't even speak in Hebrew. They were speaking the language of the the Philistines. They were speaking the language of everybody else. That's what happens. Why do you think it's so sad? And to me it's so simple. Why do you think we tell believers, please pray for your kids. Make sure they marry believers. Why? Why? Because what's going to happen? It's very simple. You have a believer. You have an unbeliever. Those, when those kids grow up in that home, what's going to happen is very simple. They're not going to naturally gravitate toward the godly things. They're going to gravitate toward the ungodly things because they already have a sin nature. That's what happened in Nehemiah's day. No, listen, that's, I'm not saying God's not a God of grace and God doesn't forgive. And if, and if Paul even addresses this in the New Testament, if you're married and one person gets saved and the other person doesn't, God still says you are, your family is holy because you're under a covenant now. And he says you pray for that other person and get saved. But you shouldn't go out looking to marry an unbeliever. That's what they did. He goes, I contended with him. Look what this guy does. He takes these guys, he plucks out their beard, he plucks out their hair, right? And he tells them to vow not to do this anymore. And then he gives a good example. He goes, you guys think you're so smart? Because I'm sure they're sitting there saying, well, wait a minute, but we love God. But wait a minute, we were trying to make them Jews. That's why we married the Ashdod women and the Moabites. We were trying to do this, Nehemiah. Wait a minute, don't pluck, ow, don't pluck my beard out. Ow, ooh, my hair. That's got to hurt. He says, you vow not to do this anymore. And he gives them an example. He goes, you guys think you're so smart? You guys think you can stay focused on loving God and raising your family for God if you're going to marry pagan women? He goes, he gives an example. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all of Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Outlandish women means women from out of the land. Women that didn't know God and the God of Israel. He goes, even him, they turned him from God. He goes, shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? And one of the sons of Jehoiah, the son of Eliashib, listen to this, the high priest was son-in-law to Sanballat the Horonite. Therefore, I chased him from me. See, Sanballat's behind all this, just like at the beginning. If he couldn't defeat him militarily, he's going to rise up from the inside with Tobiah and turn God's people away from God. Nehemiah chases him out. Remember them, O my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. Thus cleanse I them from all strangers. And appoint at the wards of the priests and the Levites, everyone in his business. He goes, I got the people back doing what they were doing. The priest and the Levites honoring God's temple and worship. And for the wood offerings at times appointed and for the first fruits, people started to give first to God again. Remember me, oh my God, for good. 
It's awesome. Listen, now this is counseling. This is good stuff right here. You know what counseling is when people are backslide? And this is what he says. He goes, you want to commit adultery? You know what they did back then? When you committed adultery, this is very simple. This is how they sent the message in Israel. When you committed adultery, this is what they did. They got you and the perpetrator, and they would bury you knee-high in a pile of dung. Okay? Manure. Knee-high, and then they'd stone you. Okay? So you fell into the manure, and you were stoned, and you died. And they don't know what they would do. They'd plant the tree on top of you. That's what they did. You know, a little fertilizer there and everything else. So that way, when people saw this tree in the center, the center of town, they saying, this, this doesn't make sense. This is like a gravel road here. Why is there a tree planted here? Because the people knew that people had committed adultery. And instead of looking at the women, they were going, hey, I'm not going to look at the tree. I'm going to look at the tree. I'm going to look at the tree. That's what they were doing. That's what they did. When the, when the children didn't honor their mother and father, right, they came home drunk and punched mom in the face. You know what they did? You took them out to the elders of the city. They said, they're not honoring. My wife just got struck in the face by my teenage son coming home drunk. They stoned him right then and there. That's good counseling, right? Very simple. It's evil. Let's just sit down. We'll try to figure it out. Now, listen, I'm not saying we, we do these things in today's day and age because we don't. But it's very simple. We need to tell people the truth of the word of God. Tell people the truth of the word of God, that God hates certain things and God loves certain things. God's angry at sin and he hates it. That's why Jesus died for it. That's why we don't have to continue in sin as God's people because we have power to have victory over those things. Let's pray.